All right, guys. It's 5:20. I hope all of you are back from <clears throat> from the tea break. Let's continue with our session. Let's start with uh, identity and access management. I hope I am audible and my screen is visible to everyone. Yes, Puneet. Thank you, Neeraj. Very much. Let's continue with identity and access management. We'll do a small demo around this, and then we'll continue to the next module of ours, which is databases. All right. Now, uh, like previously, I mentioned to all of you that AWS always believes in a shared responsibility model. Shared responsibility model implies that security of the cloud is the responsibility of AWS, and security in the cloud is the customer's responsibility. So. Uh, securing the infrastructure in terms of the physical security, in terms of uh, in in terms of the accessibility to the data center locations, uh, security staff there, all these things are responsibility for AWS. We go around. We don't disclose the location of the availability zones as well. Right? So nobody knows. It's it's only known known that they are in Mumbai. Mumbai is the region where we have the availability zones. But where the, exactly the availability zones are, we don't go around and disclose that. So then that those those are there at a non-descript and undisclosed facilities. Now the change control processes. AWS monitoring tools are there. Uh, we have firewall and other boundary devices which are there to go around and maintain the perimeter security for infrastructure uh, for maintaining the security of the infrastructure. All those things are there, and it's the responsibility of AWS. These are all the assurance programs I was referring to previously. Uh, you can download them. They are automatically digitally signed from the services section. There is an artifact section there. So AWS is certified in ISO, HIPAA, NIST, IDA from Singapore, ITKR. A lot of these compliance certificates AWS holds. Now AWS provides customer access points, also called as API endpoints, that allow HTTPS access. So that you can establish secure communication sessions with your AWS services, Hello? including your SSL and TLS. SSL uh, encrypts the transmission, uh, protecting each again. request or response from being viewed in in transit. So SSL endpoints are provided by AWS. How AWS also provides provide security it. groups, which we have already seen. They act as your instance Maybe, level uh, firewall. Oh, okay, okay. I connected. So they are your firewall at your virtual servers or at the EC2 instance level for you. Okay, okay. I'm dropping one more. We also uh, so that's that goes around and works something like this. You can set up your security group rules for your EC2 instances to create a traditional multi-tiered web architecture. From your internet, you say that the web tier is there, so we create a security group. I can name that security group as a web tier security group. Uh, HTTP or HTTPS traffic is allowed inside. From here, we can go around and specify different ports. You can have only HTTP port on which uh, the application tier can be accessed, and on Port number 1433 or 3306, whichever database you are using from your application tier, only open up that specific port number 3306 or 1433 or any other different uh, port number on which your database is running from your application tier. From my VPN network, which means from the corporate admin network, I can have SSH or RDP allowed inside. In my case, I allowed SSH from the internet as such because I wanted to demonstrate that to you. But in essence, I'll not, I'll keep that SSH and RDP separate for my corporate or admin network, right? Either on VPN or I can go around and create separate security groups. VPC we already know. You can create your uh, VPCs that allows you to add another layer of network security to your instances. Right? 
we, we saw how do you create a public subnet and private subnet as you can read about that a bit more all this would be available to you on the aws official documentation on docs.aws.amazon.com like neeraj will just go around and give a type that link for you on the questions window you can read everything about in detail about vpcs public subnet the cider blocks which i used how do you go around and create those would all the comprehensive documentation would be available to you there now let's come and talk about identity and access management right iam now iam is is this central location whereby you create your users groups roles permissions policies everything is created at identity and access management now there are two type of users when we talk about aws users there are two type of users one is a root user and one is an iam user now root user is the guy which with which you created your aws account you associated your credit card with that particular user so this is that guy who has the the unrestricted privileges he can do almost everything in aws and that cannot be controlled the permissions for a root account user cannot be controlled so nobody can revoke the permissions for a root account user as well and you sign in with your email id is the one that you use the is is the one which you use with your uh, root user account from your root user account once you log in to the aws management console by your root user you can create your iam users and you can go around and associate administrative privileges to that iam user now root user can revoke the permissions of an admin user but admin user or administrator cannot revoke the permissions of a root user right so in general what we recommend to you is never use the root user account to do the daily activities always create an iam user you can give administrative privileges or you can restrict the kind of the permissions to services which you want to give to that user as well you can be very very fine granular in in giving permissions to the iam user and then use the iam user for your daily activities for your daily functionality go around and use the iam user your authentication to an iam user <clears throat> to aws cli or sdks is based on access key id and secret access key every user based upon their permissions will have a different access key id and a different secret access key you can associate your uh, user then you can authenticate your user to the aws cli by the use of access key and secret access key now on the basis of permissions given to the user the authorization for the particular services would be based upon the access key and the secret access key that you provide right. you need to run a command aws configure in order to do that I'll just show that to you in a moment how we can access the aws services programmatically as well you can also use uh, sdks available in java python dotnet ruby c sharp we have those sdks available and you can authenticate the your users through sdks also to aws services in order to make an api call everything on aws is basically an api call so you you can manage your users by putting them in groups you can create groups in iam you can create devop groups testing group or developers group and you can Hello. put multiple users one user can only be in one Are group in? at a point of time you cannot have one user in multiple groups no sir no no i just i mean only one are based upon the policies which are associated with the user only and that policies in turn go around and define the Maybe secret access key and the, the access key which are created <laughs> the secret access id and the secret access key which you go around and use to authenticate the ah, user to aws is uh, telling about so authorization is done so on the basis of the policies, the policies are the json document uh, which are assigned to users groups or roles and this is how a policy in aws looks like you start to read ah, the policy okay. the the first version and statement is the engine which is there to 
create the IAM okay. policy, you would not be interested to read that. That's internal stuff to AWS. You would be interested from the actions. So which action do you want to allow? I want to allow EC2 describe EC2 start instance and EC2 stop instances, or you can have more actions as well like S3, VPC and so on. Now, what is the effect for all this? Whether do you want to allow all these actions or you want to deny all these actions? So that will be reflected in your effect out here. Likewise, the effect is allow. Resource defines asterisk means all, or you can specify an ARN, Amazon resource name. On a very specific resource, you can determine the access as well. Conditions are optional. You say that I want to allow the access to all these resources. On these resources, these actions can be taken only from this IP address and nowhere else. So you can go around and be very specific in, in those terms as well. Now, these conditions are purely optional. You can either give conditions or you can eliminate them as well. You, you don't give them. That's That's purely your choice if you don't give a permission which means from anywhere from any ip address you can go around and get an access to those particular aws resources that's how an aws policy looks like it's a json document basically now this iam policy can be assigned to a user or to a group and whatever users or users under a group will have they will inherit those permissions. You can also assign that IAM policy to a role as well. Roles are generally used for a short-term access, right? So IAM role uses policies. IAM role has no associated credentials with them. IAM users, application and services can assume role, right? So generally you use IAM roles when you need to do a service to service authentication you need to do a account to account authentication or you need to do within an account authentication as well iam roles helps you to basically mask your secret access id and your secret access key right? so you don't have to hard code your secret access id and your key inside your applications rather than doing that we will provide the iam role to the ec2 instance on which your application is being running over so that your application can communicate with RDS, with can communicate with S3 or any other AWS resources. So your IAM role can be assumed by a user or can be assumed by a AWS resource as well. Right? Resources like Lambda can assume a role. EC2 instance can assume a role. For an example, like your Python application hosted on an Amazon EC2 instance needs to interact with S3. AWS credentials are required for it. So you have multiple options. How do you give this application the permissions to uh, retrieve a file from S3? Your options are you can go around and store the AWS credentials on an EC2 instance, but we would like to avoid doing that because then you are exposing your uh, secret access ID and your access key if you are hard coding that in your application. We can securely distribute the AWS credential to AWS services and applications by using the IAM role. This is a better option. So what we'll do is we'll create a role and we will associate that role to the EC2 instance. So that your EC2 instance can communicate with S3 bucket. Now there are no default permissions associated with an IAM role. You have to specify the permissions which you need to give to an IAM Now, an instance profile is, is simply a kind of a container. I just imagine an instance profile. There is a terminology which you might encounter here. So if, if you guys remember, when I was creating the EC2 instance, there was a section for an IAM role, which I skipped um, because uh, I, I mentioned that we'll be discussing about that later on. And moreover, we were not interacting with any other AWS service from that EC2 instance of ours. So that's why I didn't require an IAM role at that point of time. Right. So you will also encounter a terminology called as instance profiler, which is a kind of a container for an IAM role that you can use to pass role information to an EC2 instance when the instance starts. So in this example, the IAM role named Python 
in EC2 uh, access S3 is created by an IAM user. The role grants access to the S3 bucket. So this role has a permissions to access the S3 bucket. Your application developer selects this particular role while creating the EC2 instance. The instance will host a Python application that will need access to an S3 bucket. And your this role will have that particular permissions for that access. Make a note that IAM role may be associated with an EC2 instance only during creation. Right? Or we can now do it later on as well. The policy associated with the IAM role can be modified at any particular point of time. Now the Python application is installed on the EC2 instance. Your AWS SDK for Python is also installed on that instance and the application tries to access the S3 bucket using this role. The Python application uses the EC2 instance metadata service to gain access to temporary security credentials. So you are masking your uh, secret access ID and your access key by providing this role to the EC2 instance. That's how your instance goes around and works. So we'll have the instance metadata service access that and then you will be having the access to the S3 bucket. You can also use IAM roles to have a cross account access also within the uh, within two AWS accounts. We can go around and have the access between two AWS accounts as well. User one can assume a role that role will have access to S3 and a user in a second account can also assume a role. Now this user will also have the access to that S3 bucket. So this is a cross account access. Right? We'll have to create a role which grants you permissions like these cross account access rules. Now, AWS security token service provides trusted users with temporary security credentials that can control access to your AWS resources. These credentials are like short term temporary access and works identical to long term access key credentials. But these credentials are generated dynamically and provided to the user when requested. So this session is established with your, your session is established uh, with AWS STS consists of access key ID, secret access key and a session token. With, along with your expiration time. The maximum expiration time is 36 hours. And the keys are used to sign your API request. So you can also use uh, services like Postman or Fiddler to directly make API calls to your uh, AWS services, but you have to go around and sign those API requests as well. So you can use this access key ID, secret access keys to go around and sign those requests by while making the API request to your AWS services. Now IAM remember is a service which grants you permissions for AWS services. Remember this thing. IAM will not go around and allow you cannot use IAM to create users inside your EC2 instance, which means it's not not supported for operating system OS or for application level authentication. For doing that, you use services like Cognito for providing application level authentication. We have already talked about this authentication. This is done through AWS Management Console by your username or password or access key or secret access key authorization is done by the policies associated with that particular user or with that particular role. Certain best practices which AWS uh, offers or uh, tells you, tells its users to go around and follow. Delete the root account access keys. Never give the root account access to anyone. Create individual IAM users. Use groups whenever possible to provide the permissions to IAM users. Always follow the least privilege right? grant least privileges always follow the principle of least privileges configure a strong password policy and if possible use an mfa for uh, multi-factor authentication for authenticating 
your identity to AWS services. This can be done by various hardware devices like Gmalto, YubiKey, or your Google authenticators are also supported in this case. Use roles for application that run on EC2 instances. Delegate the uh, delegate by using roles instead of sharing your credentials. So don't hard code your credentials. Uh, regularly rotate your credentials as well. Remove unnecessary users or credentials from your IAM, which you don't want. You can use policy conditions for extra security, like which I which we just saw. You can only access the uh, AWS services from that particular IP address was one of the kind of the conditions which is there. And always monitor the activity in your AWS account. You can do that by using AWS service called as CloudTrail. It records all the API activities made to your AWS account. Right? For the past 90 days, by default, this service will keep a track of all the API calls which are made to your AWS account. It deliver logs file to uh, with information to your S3 bucket, makes calls using your management console, SDK, CLI, or any other higher level services as well. You can have a dump of all those logs in your S3 bucket, which can be used for analysis. All right, guys, we'll quickly do a knowledge check. Your web application needs to write an uh, Amazon DynamoDB table and an S3 bucket. So this operation requires credentials and authorization to use AWS service. What IAM identity should you use? I guess that's pretty clear to everyone by now. If you, if you want to uh, make your application running on your EC2 instance, authenticate to any other AWS service, Hello. we'll use IAM rules for that. The appropriate in answer for this is oh, just a moment. I will log in mobile then. I'll show you a demo around this. How does an IAM work? That's role is absolutely correct. So under your services, you can go to IAM and open that up. Bring it up in a new tab. Let me show you how you can authenticate your AWS CLI to make API calls uh, to AWS services right we'll just take an example of s3 for an just to take an example we'll take s3 we'll make an api call to s3 so let me open up the command prompt cmd now i already have aws cli configured you can download the cli just google up for aws cli you can download the aws cli and then the first thing which you would like to do is run the command AWS configure. It will ask you what is your access key ID, your secret access key, the region which you want to issue your API calls it's to, true. and the, the output broke. format. So you can get your secret access key from the security credentials out here. Are you they just put your security credentials. It's also in the IAM console hmm? as well. We can go to the credentials Are out here. Let's just go here for the moment. So that's my security credentials. You can generate your security credentials, which means you can generate your access key ID and your secret access key. You sh your, the user should have permissions to access IAM in order to do this. Right? So uh, this Puneet user, which I am using, IAM user Puneet, this has an administrative privileges, hence I am able to do all these things. So I have already created the key and I have passed it on to my uh, AWS uh, CLI as well. So I'm not creating a new one right now. I just did that few days Hello. back only, I guess on 19th of April, I did that. So right now I do not Where need to bro, rotate um, my keys. Not so I'm not the doing it. Otherwise here. I'll just create an access key, which will give me two things, key ID and the secret access key. So you can check 5F7I is the last four characters, which are same to the access key ID out here. So I'm not doing that. I'm sticking to these secret access keys also being passed here. The region which I am interested to use is, let's say, ap-southeast2 only, which is Sydney. And the output format is JSON. You can type JSON out here or text also. Now I can issue commands like AWS S3 LS, which is going to I'm list all the S3 buckets for me. 
that there you go that's all the s3 buckets in my aws account you can check the bucket which we created demo s3 bucket 90 is the one which we created uh, before going for the break you can go to s3 aws s3 ls uh, you can say demo s3 bucket hyphen 90 hello Uh, Hello? Yes, demo, sorry, that's S2 I have written. But that's S3. That should go around and list the objects inside the bucket form. You can directly make calls like MD make bucket and give the name of your bucket something. Let's say I'll just give it a name like Unit-9090. And I can specify a region as well if you it don't want to happen, create bro. the bucket in, uh, in let's say Sydney region, you can specify yeah. a region name as well. I can specify AP hyphen South hyphen one, which is Mumbai. Okay, let me just not pass the. Let me just create that in Sydney region only right now. Make bucket. Invalid argument. S3 colon double slash. Punitha rule. Create this rule. That's the role name. I just copy this role name. So this role has been created. Now Puneet is an administrative user. I wanted to assume this thing that right now Puneet has all the access right I can do anything in my AWS account but somebody who does not have full access we can create a role for them that temporarily they can switch the role so let's say I want to switch a role so that they get access to those services I say I, I want to switch the role as I, I want to switch the role and within this is my role name and my account number is this copy I want to, this is my account number and I want to assume this role. Let's just switch the role. Now from my admin user I have switched a role and now I am accessing this account as an S3 full access. You can check I don't have the permissions for IAM. You can check I don't have the permissions for EC2 as well. This user, uh, sorry this role will not have permissions for EC2 for uh, VPC for IAM, he will not have access to any of those things. He will only have access to S3 full access. You can check, click on instances and you can check we will not be authorized for this. Right. Error occurred fetching the data, you are not authorized to perform this operation. Because I am accessing my AWS account via this role. But if I go to S3, I will have full permissions there because the permissions associated to this role is full access. S3 full access. I can create a bucket, I can list a bucket, you can check we have full access to S3. We can create a bucket, I can delete a bucket. Let me just try to delete that bucket which I created from the CLI. Puneet 1990 was that bucket. Let me just say I want to delete this bucket. To type the name of the bucket in order to delete that. Type the bucket name and delete it up. You can check, I'll be able to delete, successfully deleted the bucket. So this guy, this role, S3 full access role, has permissions to do that, but I don't have permissions for doing anything else. So what I have done is I have switched the role. So once my work is done, I'll say, okay, I want to come back with him. It's only for demo purposes I did that. No, I'll never, so I, Puneet also had the permissions to S3. I wanted to show you that role doesn't have permissions to what not. EC2, IEM, S3, I don't have access for all those things. Now I, I've switched my role back to uh, back, back back to normal, which is my Puneet IEM user. That was a small demonstration around identity and access management, how you can create your roles. You can create your users, you can create groups as well. Find out of this. You can create your users, you can create your groups, roles, and you can create your own level of policies as well, which have some specific kind of permissions associated to it. You say that I want, I don't, I want to be very fine granular. I want to give all the level of permissions 
So you can create your own policies also. That's also pretty much possible. Right. Okay, so that was something about IAM. Changing the IAM rule, guys, is you have created a rule and you just say you want to switch the role. If you have already switched the role, it will show you out here. Otherwise, you need to provide the account number and you need to provide the role name. Then you say switch the role. It will ask you for these two things. So, account name is, sorry, my account number. I'll have to retrieve the account number. Uh, let me just cancel this and switch the role from... from the history itself, I already have switched the role. I'll just try to do that. That's strange. Let me just sign in once again, very quickly. Let me show you how we can switch a role. So I've, I've already created a role. I just need to go around and switch into that particular role only to have the X, S3 access. Just go around and say, do you want to switch the role to this? Once you do that, you will have that role switch, so it will be highlighted a bit on the top right corner. Now you can check what all you can do. If you go to VPC and try to create a VPC, you will not be able to do that. You will not be able to do anything besides creating the uh, S3 bucket or deleting the S3 buckets or doing anything on S3. It will give you an access denied retry. We don't have the permissions for launching a VPC. Similarly, you don't have access to anything. You will not have access to EC2, Lambda, or any other thing. Okay. So that was the demonstration around the IAM, guys. I hope you got an idea about it. Let's continue with our next module now. I'll not like to close this. Let's continue with databases and let's see what are the kind of databases available with AWS. Close this. Ashik, there are uh, commands which are available through which I can switch a role through CLI. Just go around and refer to docs.aws.amazon. We'll find the respective CLI commands for switching the role from uh, from the CLI. I don't have it on the top of my mind right now, but we do have it available. All right, guys, so let's continue with SQL and NoSQL databases. And let's talk about databases quickly out here. So we, we have, uh, when we talk about uh, databases, Hello? we have databases categorized as SQL databases and no SQL you, Are databases. you able to listen now? These are the general two categorizations. Besides this, it's the ma maximum value, uh, bro. More kind of databases as well. We I, have, just, uh, I kept databases. my hand at we data, data, keep warehouses. speaker only. We That's why I'm asking, uh, are you able to listen now? in memory databases as well and so these are certain other kind of databases which are available that's that's the maximum sound of speaker bro these two hmm. because it's, 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 two it's from the browser now nah. it's not from no sql databases huh just just a moment uh, okay now now sql databases are, are generally kind of your row columns Data storage is more in the form of rows and columns. No SQL databases are more uh, from the perspective of key value pairs for us. Again, schemas are fixed, data. schemas are dynamic in case of no SQL databases. Querying on SQL databases using SQL queries. No SQL is 
more focused on collection of documents. Scalability is vertical, scalability is horizontal for NoSQL databases. Slide in this slide, this explains pretty much Hello. well how an SQL data uh -huh. is uh, is stored and what's the kind of a new SQL data. System don't have various data storage considerations, which are like no one size fits all. You need to analyze your data requirements I met, I met by considering only, bro. the data Are you able to listen? formats, the data size, query frequencies. Hello? All these things uh, needs to be taken into consideration. I'm just kept it. I uh, my phone at speaker so and I kept my phone at speakers. <laughs> no headphone. I'm using. The database which we are talking about is a are managed able to listen? databases. AWS managed the database services. And we are talking about mm -hmm. RDS. I'm not using speaker, bro. No mobile speaker. Mobile speaker. This is a managed database. I need database. to remove mobile speaker. Unmanaged databases are the ones you take an okay, easy nice. to instance. Like, how you can I speak with you? deploy your database on top of it on your own. But that's an unmanaged one. You will be Just responsible moment. for uh, for deployment of the database, for installing the database, for OS patches, for security patches, for maintenance of the database. Everything would be your responsibility. Contrary to that, in case of RDS, it's, it's a managed service. It's a partially managed service, basically. So AWS's responsibility lies with Are you uh, able to hear? installing the database, the mm -hmm. OS patches, the security patches, the DB patches for you, right? availability of the databases. All those things are AWS's responsibility. Let's move forward and talk about. So RDS is your cost efficient, resizable capacity. Uh, with less ad database administration. AWS gives you six flavors of RDS instances. We give you MySQL, we give you Postgre, Microsoft SQL, Aurora, Oracle, and MariaDB. These are six RDS instances which you can go around and use. The, f the first thing which you would create while launching a database is your database instance that would be your database ins instances just imagine your database instance as a wrapper it's a it's, it's the basic building blocks for your rds under your database instances you can have multiple databases so you can have multiple databases inside our db instances now they are an isolated database environment in cloud and can contain multiple user created databases. So it's not mandatory that you only have one database instance under it, you can have multiple of them. Backups in case of RDS, if there are two types of it. You have an automated backup. You have a manual backup as well. Manual backup is, of course, you can go around and take a manual backup at any point of time. And automated backups, you can go around and uh, th this is by default activated. We don't recommend you to deactivate the automated backups. Automated backups are taken in a specific time window, which is different for every Hello, region. Did you Mumbai cut the call? Has a time window of 4:30 p.m. till 12:30 p.m. That's an eight hours window which we have. Now, you are unable to hear or not. This is pattern of your data whenever the writes on your database. Leave it, bro. Then I send the recording now. Wait, wait, wait. AWS okay. will take a I snapshot of your database during that time period and will retain yeah. that backup for a period of 35 days. That laptop speaker is not good. It's very old. For the automated backups. Okay, okay. Fine. Mm -hmm. Now, these backups the snapshots are stored in an okay. S3 okay, bucket, then. which is managed by AWS are stored in Amazon S3 bucket. These automated backups are stored in an S3 bucket, which is maintained by AWS. Cross-region snapshots can be created. They are a copy of your database snapshot stored in different AWS regions. Now, by default, the uh, snapshots are local to that particular region in which they are created. But if you want, you can take those snapshots in any other region to spin up your new database. Do they provide you with fast disaster recovery can be accessed as base for migration of different services as well. So cross-region snapshots uh, are pretty much possible, but they are user-initiated. AWS will never go around and uh, keep the data outside of the region on its own. It will not copy the, your data without your consent outside of the region. 
AWS doesn't do that. So cross-region snapshots are available, but that's user initiated. They, we can have a snapshot copy available for all RDS engines. You can copy snapshots of any size. Copies can be moved be between any of the uh, public AWS regions, and you can copy this same snapshot to multiple regions as well simultaneously by initiating more than one transfer. That's also pretty pretty much possible. Talking about Amazon RDS security. We talk about the RDS security. We run RDS instances. Yes, somebody is saying I'm not audible. Can can everyone hear me? Neeraj, am I audible? Neeraj, guys, can you please confirm? Am I audible? Can can you please confirm? Am I audible, everyone? Uh, yeah, Puneet, you are audible. Okay, right. thank you, Neeraj. A few of the participants were saying they can't hear me. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. So talking about RDS security, we deploy the RDS instances inside a VPC in a private subnet. Why do we create a private subnet? We create private subnet for these kind of resources only. We create private subnets for uh, databases. We create private subnets for private instances, for application servers. Now, we can use IAM policy to grant access to RDS resources. Security groups would be very essential for determining the RDS security. You would like uh, you would like to open up only the very specific ports on which those RDS instances work in the security groups. We can use SSL connections with database instances. You can encrypt your data as well. You can use network encryption. You can use uh, transparent data encryption TED with Oracle DB and Microsoft SQL Server instances. They support that. And you can use security features of your database engine to control access to the database instances. Right. That's pretty much possible. These are certain of the few uh, mechanisms which you can apply for RDS security. That's a pretty simple application architecture. You have a load balancer, which is diverting traffic to EC2 instances. Your EC2 instance then goes around and communicates with your database. And then I can have a snapshot of that database stored on an S3 bucket, Amazon, Amazon RDS database instance, storing your snapshots on the S3 bucket. That can be automated or your uh, manual snapshots as well. There is something called as a multi-AZ RDS deployment, right, which is kind of uh, your uh, fault tolerant and high availability of your database mechanism. We can deploy the database in multiple availability zones, right, but you have to go around and pay for two database instances in that case. The one which is running in the primary availability zone, which means the primary database, the first availability zone, and you have to pay for the secondary copy of that and the secondary database which is running in the second availability zone. The replication type in case of a multi-AZ deployment is a synchronous replication also called as your strongly consistent replication. So the moment data is written on the primary database, primary database instance, the data is replicated onto your secondary database instance as well. The connectivity between availability zones, like we have already discussed about it, is on AWS backbone network. So that's entirely on dark fiber in itself already. If you tend to go around and apply planned maintenance, then they are applied to the standby database first. And then it, the maintenance patches are applied onto your pr uh, primary database. 
that's a scenario whereby you have primary master and you have the secondary slave database deployed in a multi AZ deployment fashion. You are paying for both the database instances in this case. Production use cases, we recommend you to always uh, create databases in uh, multi AZ deployment. Now, best practices for RDS is keep on monitoring the your database in terms of memory, CPU, storage usages. Use multi AZ deployment to automatically provision and maintain a synchronous standby. Enable automate, automatic backups always. Set up the backup window to occur during daily low in uh, write IOPS. Read and write are pretty low in that window. So with automated backups, that thing is taken care by AWS. We identify in case of your uh, manual backups, identify the backup window. You can you can also specify the window as well. When you are creating a uh, RDS instance, you can specify what is your backup window. To increase the input output capacity of your database instance, migrate the instance class to a higher input output capacity. So if you are using T2 micro, move over to T3 uh, X large or T3 to X large provision uh, provision additional capacity additional throughput capacity. So if you are using a provision IOP CDS EPS volumes, try to go around and have additional throughput capacity. Convert from standard storage to provisioned IOPS storage and use DB instance class optimized for provisioned IOPS. Provisioned IOPS are a kind of EPS volumes. Uh, which gives you best performance because the they provide you 50 IOPS per GB, 50 input output operations per second per GB. If your client application is caching the DNS data of your DB instances, set a time to live of less than 30 seconds and test failover of your database instances always, uh, especially if you have done a multi AZ deployment, try to go around and test for failover of your DB instances. Practice game days basically. RDS was relational database. Non-relational database or no SQL database which we call as is Amazon DynamoDB. That is Amazon's proprietary no SQL database which allows you to store any amount of data. Now this is a completely managed service with AWS. It's there which provides you fast predictable performance. Your data is entirely stored on uh, fast performing NVMe 2.0 SSDs. Allows you to easily provision and change the request capacity needed for each table. It's a, it's a fully managed NoSQL database service. right? So you don't have to provision uh, the storage or you don't have to provision the type of instance on which your database is running, which is there with RDS instances. You don't do that with NoSQL database. NoSQL databases, it's completely managed by AWS. You don't worry about it. You just tell the read capacity and write capacity units to AWS for provisioning a DynamoDB table. And we'll take care of the the storage of the data use cases of DynamoDB are pretty immense nowadays right a lot of organizations and a lot of application architectures they are shifting over to no sql databases now uh, gaming applications whereby you need to show the leaderboards online cataloging is a very good example of and a very good use case of uh, no sql database now you store the data in the form of items and attributes in case of a DynamoDB table, each and every item can have different attributes. So there could be a possibility that the first item which is stored in a DynamoDB table has four attributes. Artist, song title, album title here for an example. Second might only have three. I, I use my first name and last name. Some persons can use first name, middle name and last name. Unlike in case of an RDS databases, relational databases, whereby you have to confine it to a very strict schema that all the rows will have the same number of columns into it. That's not the scenario with DynamoDB. Attributes are quite similar to columns. Items are quite similar to rows. Each and every row can have a different number of columns or implying different number of attributes to different number of uh, to different items can basically have different attributes. You still have to define the primary key, which is also called as your hash key. 
also called as your partition key on the basis of this your data will be stored in different partitions this is generally used when you need to go around and improve the performance of your data uh, of your no sql databases we store the data in different partitions like your one partition can hold a maximum of 10 gb of data or maximum up to 3000 read capacity units it can go around and accommodate we can create composite primary keys as well by including a sort key as well so within a partition you can have um, uh, different sort keys so we can have uh, same partition key same sort key but a combination of both of them cannot be similar right so for one partition key you need to have different sort keys so dynamo db maintains a sorted index for both the keys like in this case table name is music partition key is artist sort key is called as song title uh, you might also hear the terminology called as uh, hash keys hash key is your partition key range key is kind of your sort key so if you hear a terminology named as range key range key is kind of your sort key zone both are quite similar you need to specify the throughput of your dynamo db table you specify how much provision throughput capacity you need for reads and writes so while creating a dynamo db table you need to specify that and amazon dynamo db allocates the necessary machine resources to meet that particular demand for yours to meet that particular need uh, one read capacity unit is equivalent to reading up of 4 kilobytes of data per second and one write capacity unit is equivalent to writing of one uh, one kilobytes of data per second depending upon your application architecture what your developers uh, might go around and let tell you that what's the read and write capacity units for your databases you will provision them accordingly you will provision your read and write capacity units supported operations on dynamodb table are query and scan scans are likewise they are bad for analysis purpose scans are not good for the table because they entirely scan your entire table or your indexes as well and they read every item which is lower than querying of course so querying basically Uh, it queries a table using your partition key and a sort key if you would have specified it so if the table has a secondary index query uh, using its keys it is most efficient way to retrieve items from a table or a secondary index as well but however aws dynamo db goes around and gives you both the options uh, either you can do a query or you can do a scan as well you can have conditional expressions as well in both query and scan that's a pretty simple application architecture your client makes a request to load balancer your application is running on ec2 instances so traffic diverted from load balancer onto ec2 instances and your data is being uh, written or fetched from a dynamo db table in this case i line of differentiation if you need to see a comparison between uh, rds and dynamo db your relational databases and your non relational databases application type in case of relational databases you can have existing database applications or business process centric applications traditional applications basically which were uh, which were used for legacy days i mean for quite some long which applications have been running over which tends to go around and run on relational databases in the new web scale applications whereby you require large number of small writes and reads uh, can be created on your no sql databases characteristics for relational database models they support complex joins and complex queries as well contrary to that no sql databases are meant for performance they are not they are meant for uh, application level performance they are not meant for complex queries remember this thing no sql databases don't support complex joins and complex queries they don't support those star snowflake schemas whereby you can have multiple hierarchical 
relationships uh, created for OLAP kind of uh, uh, transactional OLAP kind of queries and uh, data modeling. DynamoDB is not good for doing that. Right? They support simple data model and transaction and simple ranges. So it meant it, NoSQL databases are meant for performance increase, not for complex que queries and joins. Scaling in case of relational databases is more uh, horizontal in nature, which means we increase the compute capacity of the same database. On the contrary, the scaling of no SQL database is more of your vertical, which means we go around and add more compute capacity. That's on AWS because it's a completely managed service. Seamless on-demand scaling based on the application requirement. It's anyhow, uh, DynamoDB in terms of storage scaling, you needn't worry about it because DynamoDB itself is an unlimited storage. Quality of service, performance depends on data model indexing, query and storage optimization. Quite durable, like quality of service is also measured in terms of reliability, availability and durability of the database. Quality of service for NoSQL database based on performance, which is optimized, uh, uh, automatically optimized by the system. And then NoSQL databases are also pretty much reliable and very much durable. Considerations. If you need a relational database service with minimal administration, RDS is there. A fast, highly scalable NoSQL database for performance, then you will go for Dynamo. A database which you want to manage on your own, then obviously take a EC2 instance and deploy a database upon it by your own. All the maintenance work and everything would be your responsibility. A very quick knowledge check we'll do guys. What are the basic building blocks of Amazon relational database service? So that's your DB instances. Under DB instance, I can create multiple databases. Also remember when the backup is taken, the entire DB instances backup is taken. Natively, AWS doesn't support you to take the backup of only one database inside a DB instance. The backup is for entire database instance. You are creating a resilient, durable application using Amazon RDS. And in addition to that, in addition to RDS's automatic backups, what features should you use to ensure that your backups are durable retained, durably retained. Just talked about it, automated snapshots are there. You can also use manual snapshots. Amazon DynamoDB allows you to store any amount of data with no limit. This, I guess, every one of you can answer. So the answer to that is yes, DynamoDB allows us to do that. And scan is the most efficient way to retrieve items from a DynamoDB table. This, of course, is a very wrong statement. It is purely false. Queries are the most efficient way to retrieve the items from a DynamoDB table. All right, guys, let me show you a demonstration around this. And then we'll move to the last. failure at my end.
Weiß ich gern, gern, gern. We need the voice is not clear. Uh, we are, it's very feeble. Yeah, I did just one moment. Uh, I guess my audio device is only one moment. I'm checking my headset. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Am I audible? Neeraj, can you please confirm that? Yeah, you are audible, Puneen. All right, great, thank you. Not sure why my audio device just malfunctioned a bit. All right, let's do a quick demo around RDS. Let me go to Sydney region only and I'll be interested to create a database instance. Yeah, I just switched back my uh, role. I'm not using the roles right now. I'm switching back to the IAM user only. Let's go to services and I'll go to RDS. You will find this under databases out here. RDS is here. Let's go to RDS. And I'll also require an application which can connect to my EC2 instance, right? So I'll, I'll also launch an EC2 instance also, which can connect to my database. So we can see the connectivity or else I'll have to use a, a native application like MySQL Workbench or any other in order to connect to the RDS instance. So let's let's go to database first. Let's try to deploy a database, <clears throat> and then I'll come back and deploy an application on an EC2 instance, which will connect to my RDS. So let's go to databases. I'll create a database. Now, what kind of a database would you want to create? I can create an Aurora, MySQL, MariaDB. One, let's stick to let's stick to MySQL. Spin up would be more faster in this case. The template which I'll use is a dev test, a production one. I cannot use that right now because I don't have a second subnet created. That's why I'll just stick to the dev test. The DB instance identifier. Let's just name it as demo. The master username is admin. Password. Let's keep some password for the database to connect. And let's stick to a database size. So what kind of these size do I want for my database? Let me go to burstable and I can choose T2 micro or T2 small. Let's choose T2 medium. Just, just one moment. My bad, guys. I forgot to create a subnet group. Just give me one moment. I'll have to create a subnet group, which is a logical formation of the subnet on which my database would reside. Let me just create a subnet group. I'll just associate the private subnet which I have created. Okay, I already have. Uh, no, this would be a previous one. Lambda DB subnet group. Let me try to create a new subnet group, name it as demo db subnet group. OK, 
can choose a VPC. I'll choose a demo VPC from here. Availability zone 2A. And let me choose the private subnet, which is on 192.168.2.0. Right. Will it allow me to create description demo? Uh, I require at least two uh, subnets to cover at least two availability zones. Right. So I'll just create a, I'll very quickly create a private subnet too as well. Right. Public subnet, even if I don't create, will not make more difference. Just for the purposes of creating the database, I'll have to create a second subnet as well. These are certain default considerations which I have to take into mind. Let's just name in name that as demo private subnet two. Right. Public subnet two, I'm not creating that. Now this goes into demo VPC and this would be on 192.168.4.0 slash 24. So I'm leaving 3.0 for the public subnet. Let's create this subnet. Uh, just one moment. Demo private subnet. Which availability zone? My bad, I chose the first availability zone only. Just one moment. Let me delete this. I forgot to choose the availability zone to be. So demo private subnet 2 that goes into demo VPC and 192.168.4.0 slash 24. Create this. Now we are good. So we have created a private subnet 2 in availability zone 2E. So let's go to RDS and Let's go to availability zone 2B. Right, I have to refresh the subnet group. Just one moment. Let me try to refresh the subnet group. Oh, no, there is no specific logic. I am keeping a sequence. One for public, two for private, three for public, four for private, and so on. That's what I am following. Demo DB subnet group. Let's just name it as demo VPC. I'll choose as demo VPC. Availability zone 2A and we stick to 192.168.2. Add the subnet. 2B, that's the, that's the subnet we have, 192.168.4, add, and create this subnet group, demo DB subnet group, and now we can go to our database and uh, <coughs> stick to creating our database. So I'm, I'm keeping the EC2 instance type on which this database would run as T2 medium. The storage is general purpose SSD. 20 GB as of now is sufficient enough for me. And minimum we will require is 20 GB. Maximum we can go is uh, 32,768 GB, which is roughly 32 terabytes. I don't want to enable auto scaling for storage. Multi AZ deployment I don't want right now. And for the connectivity, I would put this database in demo VPC, additional connectivity, in which subnet, demo DB subnet group, public accessibility is not given to this database. Security group, I will only like to have RDS security group on port number 3306. So MySQL and Aurora both go around and talk on port number 3306. Availability zone. I can give no preference because I have already given the subnet group, so it will choose any one of the availability zones to deploy the database. And that's going to cost me $78.54. Initial database name, let's give it as demo, demo DB. And 
enable automated backups although you should not uh, disable this for the demo purposes i'm doing that i don't want to enable encryption as well no need for performance insights now uh, this is that maintenance window you can select your maintenance window on your own so patches would be applied during this time if you give no preference then for the specific region whatever is the window in which the patches are applied that would be taken into consideration enhanced monitoring also i don't want to do that i'm keeping it quite simple as of now to create the database yes. let me check the password which i have given the password i have provided username is admin and db instance identifier is demo let's create the database mysql kind of a database the engine i am creating is mysql let's create the database and that's going to take some time to deploy this database in the meantime this database is deploying i will launch a ec2 instance which will have the application which can connect to my database so i'm sticking to linux 2 amazon linux 2 e2 micro configure the instance details i am going to deploy this in demo vpc in public subnet you can check we have three subnets now one which i recently created we should get the public ip and i will pass the user data for the application just give me a moment let me pass a script to this which will hold the application for us so i'm passing the user data we already have the application hosted on this s3 bucket and we'll be downloading that application and unzipping it add storage tag name that as um sample application configure the security group and so we already have http and ssh here we can connect to that http and ssh can be done review and launch and i launch this ec2 instance as well with demo kp only knowledge this up and launch the instance that's going to take some time around 30 seconds or so to launch this sample application ec2 instance and our rds instance will also take around 5 to 10 minutes for the status to change from creating to created once it is created then i can go around and connect my application to this database and only on port number 3306 i can go around and make the traffic hit on my database instance Let's check our instance now i guess our instance should be up Let's copy this and check the public ip so apache web server is configured it should be downloading the application and unzipping any moment we should have the application also available and yes so we have the application available so we have this rds tab here and this is a this is that sample application through which i will go around and make the connectivity to my database i'll put the endpoint the database name uh, which was demo db and the username which we put was admin and password whichever i put so when the database is up we'll just take the endpoint of that database we'll specify that endpoint here and we'll make a connection to our database and check whether we can connect to the database or not so what we are doing is exactly that same thing uh, we are doing this not this architecture so this is dynamo db Yeah, we are creating this kind of an architecture. The only difference is we don't have load balancer as of now. We'll just talk about load balancer in a moment. 
We don't have the load balancer here. Our traffic is directly hitting to the EC2 instance and then a master database instance. So just eliminating the load balancer, this is the actual architecture which we are creating right now. Let's check for the database. Demo. Okay, oh, that's available now. Created. Let's go to the database. The identifier name is demo, and the database name is demo DB. That's the endpoint URL. Let's try to make a connection from this endpoint URL. Specify it here and let's try to submit this details and let's check if the username, password and database name is correct. We should be able to connect to the RDS. Okay, I guess that's giving me some error. RDS SG is the subnet demo VPC. Let's check the configuration here. The master username is admin only. The database name is demo db. So I guess the everything I'm giving it correctly out here. Demo db. Admin password I hope. I'm putting it correctly otherwise I'll have to change the password. I got it. I, I guess there's one small error I'm doing. The connection could only be made from a specific IP address. Let me just go to my RDS SG and change that. You can check. I am unable to establish the connection. It was giving me an error. The reason might be because the security group inbound rule only allows the source as this IP address which is a very specific IP address which I have. So if I want to be very much restrictive that nobody else can access my database, I'll just check for what is my public IP address. Uh, sorry, what is my public IP address? It is my public IP. That. 171.16.126.65. Let's just give that IP address inside the security group of the RDS instance. So where is that? That's there. Let it the inbound rule. I hope the custom from this 171.16 and let's try to save that rule. Sorry, this slash 32. Save. Save that rule. Now let's try to make a connection to the database and check. Let's go to endpoint, connect that. DB is demo DB, username is admin and lab. Let's put the password and try to connect. Uh, still not. Okay. I guess, okay, let me just change this to anywhere, 0, 0. Let's just save that rule. Now if I check to connect, should be able to go around and connect now. So the connection is being making, it's executing that command, MySQL username admin, and there we go. So that's the database connectivity which we have done. That's a sample data which we have in the database. The application wrote that sample data on the database. I can add more data on this as well. You can say to write some data here, something. Add. 
submit and that should go around and make a write on my database. That was something about your RDS instances. How do we create a RDS instance in, and how do we make a connection to the RDS instance? This is created in a private subnet. So I cannot directly go around and use native applications to make a connection to my RDS instance via this endpoint. That's not going to happen. Was one first thing, it does not have a internet access to it. And I can be very restrictive by providing the security group as well. All right, so that was about RDS. Let's see our last module for the day which is elasticity and management tools. Let's talk about elasticity and management tools. Just close this and let's talk about the last module, which is our elasticity and management tools. I hope that gave you a fair bit of idea, guys, about how RDS works. Uh, I could have uh, placed that RDS in a public subnet and given it a public accessibility. Then I could have used MySQL Workbench or any other native applications. I could directly go around and use the CMD as well and directly connect if I have a MySQL, uh, MySQL server installed on any of the EC2 instances. You can directly go around and make a connectivity to that database as well. It's also pretty much possible. I did that by the use of an application. Let's talk about elasticity and management tools. Right, let's see what, are, what is elasticity and management tools. Now, this is the most, um, one of the most important topics in this uh, technical essentials. The reason is, um, you remember that uh, when we were discussing about the advantages of cloud, the third advantage of moving to cloud was stop guessing about capacity. And we are going to see that now that why the advantage is there, why that advantage is there for stop guessing about capacity. How can we stop guessing about capacity? There are three services which you can use hand in hand in order to stop guessing about capacity. We call them as triad of services. Those three services are your CloudWatch, auto scaling group and your load balancers. Let's see how does that work? How does this thing work? You, your users are hitting your load balancer. Now, if more number of users are hitting to your load balancer, you might go around and have increased latency. Right? Or if the CPU utilization of my EC2 instances goes high, I can consider that as to be a spike, right? which means additional traffic and uh, coming and hitting to my application because might be I am running a game day or probably Friday night sales or uh, there's a festival season coming over because of that a lot of people are going online and doing some shopping or whatever the scenario might be. They are hitting the your application, which is behind the load balancer because load balancer is supposed to divert the traffic to the EC2 instances. So we somehow intelligently go around and create a monitoring system. That monitoring system is your CloudWatch. CloudWatch is the monitoring. Imagine it as a CCTV camera. This guy is there to track your utilization of your resources, to monitor your resources. Now, what can it monitor? It can monitor the latency for a load balancers, for an example. It can monitor the number of outstanding requests on the load balancers. It can monitor the CPU utilization for EC2 instances. It can monitor the disk read operations for EC2 instances. It can monitor the, uh, the network bytes in or the network bytes out for, for the EC2 instances. So for different kind of resources, it had different monitoring metrics which are available. So once we create that intelligent monitoring system on whatever basis you want to determine that it's a heavy load on your application, be it on the basis of utilization or latency, that would be captured by your CloudWatch. Now CloudWatch will raise an alarm. The job of CloudWatch is to monitor and raise an alarm. So CloudWatch will trigger an alarm right, 
on whatever basis you specify and that alarm will ask the auto scaling group to execute a scaling policy whatever we would have specified in it that scaling policy would have a policy of adding one more ec2 instance inside the auto scaling group so previously we had two we will have one more auto scaling group being launched inside the auto scaling group out here and the load balancer now will divert the traffic to this third ec2 instance as well so rather than configuring the load balancer to divert traffic to specific ec2 instances we would tell the load balancer to divert the traffic to the auto scaling group so if you have three ec2 instances in the group it will divert traffic to three four it will divert the traffic to four ec2 instances if you have 10 ec2 instances load balancer will divert the traffic to 10 ec2 instances in a round robin fashion that's how the load balancers goes around and work let's see that in more detail let's talk about load balancing now load balancing supports uh, there are three kind of load balancers essentially which aws goes around and supports the job of them is to distribute the traffic to multiple ec2 instances in multiple availability zones remember this we can have cross zone load balancing multiple availability zones supports health checks to detect unhealthy amazon ec2 instances you can access and work with your load balancers using one of the following interfaces like uh, your management console your command line tools or your aws sdks as well i can create my load balancers through any of these ways that's how your classic load balancer is you register instances with your load balancer load balancer routes request at either your tcp or your application layer which means layer 7 of the osi model or layer 3 of the osi layer uh, yeah, layer 3 of the osi model uh, it, it's also called as your sorry that's layer 4 of the osi model. classic load balancer used to support both but that's a old generation one right now we have application and network load balancer these two let's talk about network first of all then i'll come to the application later on application load balancer works on layer 7 of the osi model you register the instances as targets in a target group and route traffic to the target group in our case what we'll do is we'll associate this target group to the auto scaling group right so whatever number of targets we'll have in this the auto scaling group will keep on adding the targets in this target group the load balancer will keep on diverting the traffic there load balancer route request at the application layer which is your http or https layer in this case right so which will specify the rules out here for that you can also divert the traffic to multiple ports as well your load balancers can listen to different ports and we can have application diverted your request being diverted to different ports as well port number 80 81 82 whatever ephemeral ports you have and whichever ports are opened up we can do that configuration also load balancer application load balancers can also support path based routing for you as well right so path based routing is something like this if your request is coming with slash api diverted to different set of an ec2 instances if you have a request coming in with slash mobile then diverted to a different set of ec2 instance so on and so forth. that's the path based routing content based routing is also supported with application load balancers next you have is a network load balancer this guy works on layer 4 of the osi model which is your transport network and transport layer you register instances at targets in target groups and route traffic to your target groups now this cannot network load balancer cannot support path based routing because http is only supported at layer 7 uh, of the osi model right layer 4 doesn't support http so you can't have the path decoding at the application layer uh, at the network layer sorry but network load balancers sub goes around and gives you best performance right? you can have uh maximum throughput in case of network load balancer this works with static ips also so in order to give you a comparison between the load balancers classic is is a kind of combination of both application and network it's on old generation one so aws have 
subdivided the features into application and network load balancers now. Platforms it used to support is VPC, is application and network. Classic used to support EC2 classics also. So EC2 classics are old generation kind of EC2 instances for us, which can work without having the load balance, or without having the VPCs. Cross zone load balancing is supported in all the three logging is there in all the three path based routing you can check is only there with application load balancer sticky sessions obviously load balancers application load balancer can only support it static ips can work with network load balancer so sticky sessions is that uh, because of any kind of network disruption if you have your session is terminated abruptly the next time if you divert a request, your load balancer will divert you to the same EC2 instance on which you were working previously. So your session is maintained. So we have sticky sessions in case of application load balancers. This guy CloudWatch is a monitoring service, which I already told you. It can monitor your resources, like visibility into resource utilization, operational performance, and overall demand patterns, which are there. Amazon CloudWatch facts. We can go around and set alarms. Now, the, see, remember the job of CloudWatch is only to monitor and raise an alarm. Right? So it's like it's it's like a service which will not intervene. It it's not there to to uh, add the EC2 instances for you to or to add the compute. That job is there with the auto scaling group. This is not there with the load balancer uh, this is not there with the cloud watch sorry adding or terminating of the ec2 instances is with your is with your auto scaling group not with the cloud watch the cloud watch will only trigger the alarm for you talk about the architecture of cloud watch Now, AWS resources that support CloudWatch, for an example, almost all the AWS resources, they go around and support CloudWatch. You can check your CPU utilization. You can check, um, you can go around and check the disk reads, disk write, latencies, uh, messages in a queue. A lot of services are supported with CloudWatch. For an example, we are in, we are interested to capture the CPU utilization. For an example, so you'll have a CloudWatch metrics which can configure, which can check your CPU utilization. So if your CPU utilization increases a particular threshold, which means 70%, 80%, 70%, 80%, or goes below 30% or 20%, whatever you specify, then raise an alarm. Now that alarm can trigger an auto scaling group. That's how that will work. You will have a per instance metric. You can check the CPU utilization. If it goes beyond a particular threshold, trigger an alarm. And then that will trigger the auto scaling group. Job of auto scaling group is to scale your EC2 capacity well suited for application that experience variability in usage and available at no additional charge. So you only pay for the EC2 instances, which are spent inside the auto scaling. We have better fault tolerance, better availability and better cost management. Likewise, we are not anticipating anything prior hand. We are not doing that. So you stop guessing about capacity. For creating an auto scaling group, you have to create a launch configuration in which you will specify what is the AMI ID, what is the instance type, what is the key pairs, what are the security groups, block device mapping, and the user data. You can specify all these things. Once you have the launch configuration, we'll create an auto scaling group. So you can specify what's the minimum number, the maximum, and the desired capacity of the EC2 instances you want inside the auto scaling group. Instances in an auto scaling group are treated as logical grouping for the purpose of instance scaling and management. So once you have 
auto scaling group in place then it can automatically spin up the ec2 instances or terminate the ec2 instances as well and that's the minimum size that's the desired capacity and this is the maximum size maximum implies that uh, your auto scaling group will not add more than 10 instances any house no matter what happens minimum is it will always keep at least one instance for you desired is that uh, when you launch an ec2 instance this is the bare minimum which will go around and the number of instances which will be there for you all so if you go around and terminate all the ec2 instances start up with the desired capacity of 2 right. we can have dynamic scaling like this what we were discussing previously you can create a scaling policy that uses cloudwatch alarms to determine when your auto scaling group should scale out or scale in see remember uh, stop guessing about capacity does not only mean you add the capacity it also means that you should have the capability to scale out as well which means to terminate the ec2 instances also because you have to take care of the costing as well you have to consider your cost also so it it should be a policy uh, your cloudwatch should raise an alarm which is a kind of a negative alarm which should terminate your ec2 instances also that's auto scaling life cycle basic life cycle talk about this we scale out on the basis of cloudwatch or we can also scale out on the basis of scheduled event as well once we have scaled out that goes around and launches an instance that instance is launched inside the auto scaling group scale in means cloudwatch will raise a negative alarm or a terminate alarm and will terminate the ec2 instance detach it and terminate the instance you will have your uh, load balancer would already have been configured to distribute the traffic to the auto scaling it takes some time uh, you have to specify that your cpu utilization is there for uh, one data point for at least one minute then it will go around and so it's not something like in milliseconds it will start to add an ec2 instance the bare minimum is at least one minute you have to go around and specify also to save on your cost aws gives you trusted advisor as well right? so trusted advisor is is that guy which uh, it's, it's a service basically it has several uh, plans available into it you have an enterprise level plan and you have a basic recommendation plan you have an enterprise recommendation plan as well it can let you know that uh, which are all the areas on which you can save your cost do you have any performance issues are there any security vulnerability in your architecture and do you have any fault tolerance or do you have a breach of service limits trusted advisor provides you those services giving you your guidance to help you reduce cost by increasing performance and security so you have core checks which are included this is for business and enterprise support and this is full trusted advisor benefit plans which are there this is paid right guys quickly we'll do a knowledge check auto scaling helps you uh, helps you to ensure that you have the correct number of ec2 instances available to handle the load for your application is that true or false you all can figure out that that mm -hmm. is true what features would you use with an auto scaling policy to determine when your auto scaling group should scale in or out we will go around and use cloudwatch alarms we can use scheduled events as well but cloudwatch alarms is the one which will tell us whether we should scale in or scale out so you have an application composed of individual services and need to route a request to a service based on the content of the request what type of load balancer should you use i guess this everyone should be able to answer correctly what type of load balancers that's your application load balancer so you have to route the request to a service based on the content 
content based routing is possible with application load balancers which aws service serves as a best practice and recommendation engine just talked about it trusted advisor i guess let's quickly do a demonstration on this as well and then we it's the last module which we have i'll take 15 minute of yours we already have everything up and running for us so i already have the application running like this sample app is already here for me so i'll just deploy the auto scaling architecture quickly so we can check these uh, these scale in and scale out of the ec2 instances we'll take not more than 10 15 minutes first of all i launch a ami from this sample application because an application is running on this this technical essentials application is running on top of it it has a load test application on it which does a stress testing on the cpu so with so on this specific ip address we are sending some random junk traffic back in order to increase the cpu utilization so i want to create an ami out of it i'll create a image and name it as a demo app and we'll create the image now till the moment the image is being created we can create a load balancer and rest of the configurations i can do so what i am about to do is i am about to create this architecture this entire architecture i am about to create let's go to let's, let's create load balancer first we'll create a load balancer i'm interested to create an application load balancer name it as demo lb demo load balancer it's an internet facing one we should deploy Okay, now my bad. I should have a public subnet two as well for this. So let me just create a public subnet two quickly. Name tag. Let me name it as demo public subnet. Otherwise, load balancers cannot be deployed in single availability zone. Demo VPC two B, and this I'll create on one nine two dot one six eight dot three dot zero slash twenty four. Create this. and i'll just associate the public route table with this public subnet 2 which i have just created route table edit the route table association and i'm going to associate the public route table with this so it has the igw route and now this subnet is a public subnet let's go to the load balancer and create a load balancer demo right, let's choose two subnets public subnet 1 from first az and public subnet 2 from the second availability zone configure this security what kind of traffic should hit it http is good enough so i already have that security group with me i'm selecting that not creating a new one target group name it the demo tg target type is an instance and i can do the health checks out here port is my traffic port which is port number 80 the port the load balancer uses when performing health checks so port number 80 would be used in this case the default is the port on which each target receives the traffic from the load balancer but you can specify a different port as well this was i was mentioning to you previously we can go around and have health checks on port number 81 82 83 so on but in our case it's not required healthy threshold i'll just decrease these limits a bit so that i get the intimation of having an instance healthy quickly register the targets now i am not registering the targets manually right now the reason is because targets would be added by the auto scaling group so the emr is map reduced that's a big data technology you go around and run your emr clusters something like you go around and run your spark jobs you run big data analytic jobs you run hue you run scoop so all those big data terminologies are there emr is elastic map reduce it's, it's, it's related to big data for aws so i'll create this load balancer now i 
and good. So we have created the load balancer close. That's provisioning right now. So till the moment it's provisioning, let's create the auto scaling group. So for that, I'll require the launch configuration. I'm going to create a launch configuration here. AMI I'll choose is the demo app AMI, which I created. I'll not choose a blank Linux instance. The kind of EC2 instances, let's stick to T2 micro is okay. Configure the details. Name this as demo launch configuration. No need for an IAM role right now. Monitoring, I'll activate the detailed monitoring, which is every one minute monitoring. And that's it. Add storage security group again the traffic is http http uh, http traffic is good enough so that security group is good enough for us and we'll create this launch configuration although i don't have to provide a, a key pair to it so i can just say that proceed without a key pair acknowledge that you don't i don't need to ssh into my instances so i'll just do that without a Keep here. And now we'll create the auto scaling group. So just now we created the launch configuration. And now I'll create the auto scaling group. The desired capacity I want is two. I want to create my EC2 instances in demo VPC in private subnets. So private subnet one and private subnet two. I don't want my these application servers, I'm assuming them as to be my application servers, and I don't want them to be public facing. So I'm putting them in private subnet. And we are going to receive the traffic from one or more load balancers. <clears throat> that was the target group which we chose. The health chip, the health check type I'm choosing as EC2 only. You can do a ELB health check as well. Health check grace period, 60 seconds is good. Enable CloudWatch detailed monitoring. We can configure the scaling policy now. So you can say scale between minimum is one and maximum I can say 10 or 15 or whatever, depending upon the service limit which you have. And now I'm going to configure the CloudWatch. So I'm saying scale the auto scaling group using step or simple scaling policy and add an alarm. To increase the group size, I'm adding an alarm. So when my average CPU utilization goes greater than 70% for one consecutive period of one minute, increase capacity. I'm naming this alarm as increase capacity alarm. Create the alarm. So if the increase capacity alarm is raised, add one instance. And similarly, I will decrease the capacity also I'm say when the average CPU utilization is less than and equal to 30% for at least one consecutive period of one minute, then <clears throat> decrease the capacity. Decrease its capacity. Let's say create this alarm. So terminate an EC2 instance. You say remove one EC2 instance you want to configure some SMS notifications or email notifications, you can do that. Name this something peculiar, we'll name it demo auto scaling group instances. Instances, review and create the auto scaling group. So we have created the auto scaling group now. And that's it, we have pretty much done we have created load balancer, CloudWatch, and auto scaling group. All these three things we have created. Let's test our architecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the load balancer. Uh, before doing that, let's go to EC2 instances and check. Uh, let's go to instances. Let's this from here then. Uh, where is the EC2 instance? Let's go to instances here. And you can check, we should have two instances by the name of demo ASG instance should be spinned up for us. So they are running and they are initializing right now. So they are being launched and the application is being installed on both of them. 
let's go to the load balancers now we'll take the a record which is the dns name of the load balancer and then we'll check our application that's the arn that's the dns name of the load balancer for us a record let's pick this up and try to test our application and there you go so now we can check the application is running correctly we can check the target group as well we should have the instances under healthy state let's go here and check the targets both the targets are healthy status for both the in ec2 instances are healthy basically this is our load balancer i can check if i have refreshed the request it should be diverted to availability zone to be out here and check it I refresh it check it now is diverted to 2b so the moment somebody will keep on hitting your hitting a request to your load balancer it will be diverted to either 2a or 2b respectively let's increase the load let's do a load test on our application and now we'll just wait for around 2 3 minutes and that should increase the ec2 instance for you so we'll, we'll just keep a check on this uh demo asg instances we have two right now we should have three any moment so it will take around 1 to 2 minutes it will take to launch the new instance because the cpu load is 100% now right just check that and that's all from my side guys i do hope you learned some new things and you got a fair bit of idea about how aws services work this this was an architectural site for aws so we discussed a lot of things we discussed about networking storage compute ec2 instances s3 we talked about did a demo of pretty much everything so we have covered a lot in this 5 hours which was allocated to me just wait for few moments and we'll check this uh, ec2 instances should come up for us i hope your queries neeraj would have answered guys most of your queries would have been answered uh, can refer to the aws documentation for most of your queries we have a very comprehensive documentation which is there so elb versus ec2 health check nishant is um, see EC2 has certain parameters for determining as healthy, right? You have a heartbeat check. So heartbeat is like a ping plus some hardware checks are and driver checks are also done in this case. So the health check is done for EC2 instances. Your ELB health check we go around and check the status of the load balancers as such and whether the load balancer can divert the traffic. to the ec2 instances on also whether the port is working in that case and it is opened up or not right. that's the basic line of differentiation between that go around and read the documentation as such uh, the docs.aws we have a very comprehensive documentation we'll go around and find almost all your queries out there we we did had a lot of good participants the number of participants were quite good we had So a lot of queries we were receiving there, and I'm not sure why the voice issue was there. So a lot of you were able to hear me correctly, but I was receiving that complaints from few of the participants that they were unable to hear me. So anyhow, uh, I guess uh, that can be. We will have these sessions more of them, so you can try to attend any other of these sessions as such. Let's try to check now uh, whether it increases the. is it to instance for us or not Let's keep on refreshing it. it should automatically add a new is it to instance for us
let's refresh now and check yep so there you go so we have one more ec2 instance guys which goes around and is being initiated automatically for us because the cpu load is 100 percent if i close this application now and cpu utilization goes zero it will automatically terminate the ec2 instances as well so we'll, we'll also go around it's not only adding the compute capacity scaling means whenever you require you add more capacity if you don't require terminate it also so you have to take the cost also into consideration you don't overpay for unnecessarily running your compute capacity when it's not required what's my point so i hope you got an idea about it everyone and that would be all from my side for this technical essentials day thank you for being a very patient listener everyone i i do hope you learn some new things i pray uh, safety for all of you just be safe in these very uncertain times which we are going through right now and all the very best for your aws journey thank you guys thank you very much thank you everyone Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.